All right, everybody. My lovely, lovely imps. Today, I am going to be uh, slightly bending one of my usual rules, um, which is that I don't really get involved in any sort of stupid drama, and I especially try to avoid Twitter discourse. But today, I'm going to be bending that rule just a tiny, 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 tiny bit. And by that, I mean I am going to talk about uh, a, a Twitter-related discourse. And the reason I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do my best to take it above and beyond the Twitter drama, um, but the reason I'm going to do this is because it's a topic that I think is um, fairly interesting to me. Um, now, in the time since this, uh, this <laughs> the topic that I'm about to explain to you began it has gotten very as as is typical of the absolutely deranged and horrible website uh that barely functions formerly known as twitter um the conversation has degraded even worse than it was when it started um and has since gotten incredibly toxic um however uh, i want to talk about a couple of aspects of this conversation that I think are genuinely important. Um, and l first off, let's just get it out there. Let's talk about the tweet that started all of it, okay? Um, I'm gonna put a tweet up on the screen real quick and I want you all to sit here with me, okay? So, um, this is a tweet from Actual Jake, AKA at Actual Corn on Twitter. Uh, uh, Actual Jake is a content creator um, who has done uh, a lot of uh, atheist content, um, does some like left-leaning content. Uh, I have spoken with Actual Jake. I have done some some uh, various my, like like uh, group projects with Actual Jake, including like uh, uh, panels and stuff. And generally, I think Actual Jake is a pretty funny guy. Um, Here's the, here's the take, okay? Black Americans, and this is a quote, I'm gonna quote this. Black Americans are religious because they were indoctrinated into it by their slave owners historically. Sounds not good. Um, now, as you can probably imagine, this take has, um, has gone nuclear and and it's actually funny because the original tweet didn't even get that much engagement you can see this is a pretty low level of engagement i mean a lot of views but fairly low level of engagement however the discourse itself has spread pretty far and actually breached far beyond twitter into other spaces now um this is an interesting take uh and i want to be clear i pretty strongly disagree with this read. Um, and I especially disagree with the way that it was worded. Um, the idea that black Americans are only religious because they were indoctrinated by slave owners is ahistorical on, on numerous angles. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think it's, um, I think that first of all, there's, uh, the religious saying that it's um, black Americans are religious only because they were indoctrinated is actually just fl flatly incorrect. Um, obviously, not only uh, do other religions predate slavery uh, in Africa and among uh, you know populations that were enslaved in America, um, but actually Christianity pre like c considerably pre-exists slavery. Uh, in Africa, at least the slavery that's being referenced here, which is the American uh, transatlantic slave trade. Um, an example of this is that the Coptic Church, which is a Christian church that, that developed alongside the Catholic Church, uh, was founded in Egypt in 42 AD. Now, the transatlant transatlantic slave trade did not begin until hundreds and hundreds of over a thousand years later, but the Christian church uh, uh, was was present in and all over Africa for that entire time. So I, I understand, I think what was meant to be said in this tweet was actually black Americans are Christians because they were indoctrinated in, into it by their slave owners. 
And obviously, that isn't um, actually uh, accurate either, in my opinion. Now, I'm going to stop right here, and I'm going to say that there, I'm going to attempt to deconstruct this issue at its core. Uh, and that means that most likely everyone involved with this is probably going, or, or everyone involved with this particular drama uh, is going to want to slot me into a side onto it. Um, I have already taken my position that I think this tweet is incorrect. However, I think that there's somewhere buried in this tr in this tweet, there is a an attempt to get at something that is true. Um, and I want to talk about that thing, which is indoctrination, okay? Um, not by slave owners, but generally in Christianity. Um, because I think that what was a tent, what I'm trying to assume the best faith here. I don't really know exactly what actual Jake meant here. Uh, as I understand it, actual Jake is going to be doing a, a couple of debates with other people on this particular, not debates, discussions, I guess. Maybe they're debates. I don't really know. Uh, but I guess he's going to do it and that's for him. I'll be interested to see on a personal level what what he really meant here because obviously Twitter is a terrible platform to discuss any of these ideas. Um, but uh, what I, one thing that, but I want to talk about the indoctrination in Christianity and in some evangelical religions uh, while also just saying, no, it's not actually uh, uh, true that black Americans are religious uh, or Christian just because they were indoctrinated into it by their slave owners. Um, and and uh, ha so, okay, let's talk about this. So uh, uh, let's talk about the indoctrination aspect and then we're gonna go back and we're gonna talk about uh, religiosity and Christianity in, in black communities uh, in America. Um, so indoctrination. Um, as many of you know, I say this literally all the time. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I say this literally all the time. I grew up in an extreme Christian cult. Um, they uh, are have spread themselves all over the United States. They are incredibly conservative. They are uh, uh, socially regressive in just about every way you can imagine. Uh, and uh, uh, they proselytize aggressively. Um, However, their biggest way that they, uh, uh, that they maintain the core of their church uh, is not through, uh, you know, man on the street evangelism. Um, in fact, they are, their conversion rate of just walking around and handing out Bibles and preaching to people on the street is incredibly low. In fact, the way that they grow the most is by f loyal families to the church having lots of kids and raising those kids in the church environment, sending those kids to the church's school, t sending those kids to the Sunday school, to the, to the actual schools that they run. They have a Christian private school, having, uh, uh, having your family members attend the churches and give money. Um, and become integrated into the social network. Um, that is actually how a lot of these really extreme Christian uh, uh, churches actually maintain the core of their strength. Now, of course, there are still lots and lots of converts. However, a lot of the people who are converts um, are not exactly people who um, are completely fresh to Christianity. Um, it's not like people have never heard of Christianity or weren't Christians. In fact, a lot of the people who convert to churches like the one that I grew up in um, come from another branch of Christianity, um, usually a less extreme branch, and they are drawn into the extreme branch because of the zealousness and the, the uh, intensity of those beliefs. They're, they're converting, but they're not converting from another religion to Christianity. They are simply shifting the flavor of Christianity that they already are. So while this topic that we are using as a launching point is, is not um, 
really correct. It isn't really accurate to say that the only reason uh, why anyone is religious is is because they were indoctrinated uh, by, but specifically black Americans were indoctrinated by slave owners. There is a very, very intense, uh, uh, pay, uh, what's the right word here? Familial inheritance uh, that is tied to religion. And I do believe that in a lot of cases, this does take the shape of indoctrination. Um, it's weird too, because uh, I, I think that, that you could change this original tweet to say, Americans are Christians because of indoctrination, not because of, uh, of, of a genuinely held belief, and it would actually be more accurate. Um, and I don't even think that it's a matter of, uh, like I don't think you can trace the lineage uh, to any specific point in history because the reality is that Christianity as a whole has embedded itself so deeply in so many aspects of society that nearly everyone has the values, a lot of the values of Christianity embedded into them um, from multiple angles constantly. Now, not everyone would consider that a, a fair representation of the term indoctrination. Um, and I think that there's a certain uh, amount of truth to saying that uh, the passive ambient values of your society isn't exactly the same thing as indoctrination. However, what goes on in churches like the one that I grew up in, what goes on in a lot of churches, uh, particularly American evangelical churches, is indoctrination. It is deliberately taking children, putting them in religious education uh, so that they are trained how to think and what to believe uh, very stringently um, for most of their lives. Um, and you can now probably see why I thought it was so important to, to actually talk about this issue on my stream because um, I think that in this particular uh, discourse, uh, the the spice severely got in way in the way of an actual conversation about something that's serious, which is the fact that Christianity is an aggressive religion that actively encourages parents not to teach their kids uh, any sort of critical thinking, but rather to teach their kids to accept uh, a a set of beliefs. Um, uh, you know, verbatim from a book. Um, and it's it's actually a big problem because uh, you'll notice that so, that like a, a lot of American evangelical sects, uh, if you would try to engage in conversations about even the Bible with members of these groups, they often aren't able to actually engage in those conversations because they don't even, they're not even willing to recognize that the Bible is a book that can have multiple interpretations, that there are literally thousands of millions of different reads of of the bible that people have been arguing about for all of history um and a lot of them just don't believe that they believe that whatever version that they've interpreted is the real interpretation and that it, it is actually um uh, blasphemous or sacrilegious or disrespectful to even imply that the the word of god could be interpreted in a bunch of different ways um and uh, um, it's a, uh, yeah. Um, indoctrination is a big part of American evangelical Christianity. And uh, Christians, progressive Christians out there um, would, 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 would grow as, as people and would have a stronger position in their own religious beliefs if uh, if they're willing to acknowledge that this is the case, that, uh, that American evangelicalism is remarkably devoted to um, teaching, uh, to, to, to encouraging people not to spin off and, and be, and you know, be a little bit, dis, you know, disorganized, but the quiverful movement 
is a perfect example of this. The Quiverful movement is a very popular movement among American evangelical Christians that says that they're, you know, it's, it's very popular specifically with, um, you know, the, the movement itself is very popular with Christian women who believe that it is their job to basically have as many children as possible so that they can be raised up in the ways of God so that there will be more Christians to do the same thing. A literal multiplicative effect. If you have eight kids and all of your eight kids have eight kids, well, then there's a lot more Christians in the world. Um... And that's a very, that's a widespread movement. Even the people who don't identify as quiverful people also uh, uh, often adhere to some of its principles. And the, and the quiverful movement is only the evangelical side of it because everybody knows uh, that, that, that it, the Catholic Church explicitly encouraged this for a very long time and still to this day, the Catholic Church, though in opposition in some ways to uh, evangelical Protestantism, obviously, there's a huge schism there. Uh, they're both still Christians, but they have uh, very different beliefs. Uh, ca Catholics discourage the use of, um, of birth control for that very reason, because they believe that it is important that Catholics have children. Um, this is a part of it. Obviously, they also believe that, like, that you should that that part of having sex has to be a procreative pro procreative act and that uh taking um you know birth control uh, interrupts with that aspect of sex but let's be real a lot of the reason is because they want to see uh catholic families have lots and lots of catholic children and the reason for that is because Catholic people will likely bring their kids up in a Catholic church. It's the same basic idea. Um, so uh, the, the, the indoctrination part of this conversation is a serious thing that needs to be discussed. The fact that it is very common among American Christianity to push a very traditionalist view of things to push uh, a a um, a position or a, a frame of mind that is um, actively resistant to critical thinking, actively resistant to developing your own creed, and instead encourages you to take what you are what you are taught and repeat that to your children. Um, is is that is that is a form of indoctrination it is a widespread and normalized form of indoctrination um and it's complicated because obviously uh everyone every child has to learn from something and there are all kinds of types of indoctrination that happen right like we can all acknowledge that like uh, i mean i've even talked about this that the public schooling system um uh, often over the course of time essentially does indoctrinate people not only into hyper patriotism but um, into uh, a, a frame of mind that that basically teaches them that they are their job their purpose in the world is to work that they are not actually really you know individual creative thinking beings um but rather that they are learning so that they can do a better job at a job so that they can be productive to society as a whole um so indoctrination generally in our society uh goes uncriticized um and uh yeah, yes, as, as uh, Brandy in, in YouTube chat says, the public school system teaches people to fulfill assignments and also actively like trains people to, to think about the world as a kind of a giant checklist, that your life is a checklist of things that you are supposed to do in the correct order, uh, which just so happens to be to the benefit of the, uh, the economy as is. Um, and... Yeah, and that's uh, and that's kind of messed up, right? Um, and of course, like I said, in in the world of of Christian religiosity, this is magnified even further, um, because there is this aspect of 
uh, no, not only do you need to like uh, accept that like America is number one, not only do you need to accept uh, that like capitalism is the way God has basically built the world and it's, it's a good thing, um, but also you need to be studying this book uh, uh, you know, with great intensity and specifically certain interpretations of this book, uh, which also often directly plug into uh, the political views of the people in power. Um, I've mentioned this many times in the church that I grew up in, which was very extreme. Um, and I acknowledge that it was very extreme, that most people do not have this level of extremity in their churches. Um, but uh, the political, the integration of political and religious was, they were inseparable. Every single sermon had extremely political culture war aspects as a part of it. Everything from the battle, the culture war around evolution to um, gay rights was a huge issue, constantly coming up in sermons um, as a way to reinforce people's positions in the correct direction. And I would argue that especially with the number of children who are having that driven into them at all times that absolutely qualifies as a form of indoctrination, dangerous indoctrination, in my opinion. Didn't feudalism exist before capitalism? Yes, but um, they don't really, but a lot of Christians, especially uh, American Christians, don't really think about that aspect. Or if they do, they go, well, you know, having a good king is great. But having a bad king is terrible, which means that, you know, democracy under capitalism is actually the best way for things to be because it's a merit based system and God will bless you. Uh, and, you know, uh, so, you know, we support this system, you know, but we want it to go the right way. We want it to be a, a democracy under God. It's a very weird thing. And um, again, like uh, I I've talked about this separately. I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent because that's a I could discuss the whole complexity of the Christian American view on democracy and and monarchy. Uh, I could discuss that for an entire segment. So I don't want to get too distracted on that. I want to try and stick to this issue about indoctrination. Um, but um, yeah, uh, uh, the indoctrination issue in Christianity is a huge is a huge issue that I do believe needs to be challenged and 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 tackled, and um, and I think it's it's it goes more than just like uh, than just like sa like saying uh, oh broadly well you know it's a it's a problematic behavior it's it's very deeply ingrained in in most forms of Christianity. Even churches that are fairly uh, mild by comparison to churches like mine um, actively acknowledge that, that their goal is to raise children up the right way, uh, to use Christianity as a way to guide and shape their children's behaviors, which, um, you know, uh, uh, might, you know, on one hand, parents are going to raise their children, yes. Um, but uh, 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 it is w within the text of the, the Christian holy books, within the trends and the beliefs of various uh, uh, sects of Christianity, it is actively encouraged to shy away from other potential ways of thought, to specifically focus on bringing them up only in a Christian way, uh, to, never, uh, to never even spend time considering other worldviews, uh, sometimes to actively discourage it. Um, you know, I mean, God, how many times in the Bible does it does does the the text denounce the wisdom of man uh, and the the uh, you know, the practice of 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 um, worshiping false idols or uh, or 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 various other uh, t ways of wording this type of, you know, fear the other and and denounce the other. Uh, there is an insular quality in a lot of Christianity that does make it dangerous, that makes it um, intolerant, that makes it xenophobic, that makes it incapable of uh, interfacing easily with other religions. There is a uh, supremacy that, that runs through a lot of Christianity. This is especially true in the major uh, uh, organized sects of Christianity. Catholicism, 
um, the 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 mega church movement in America, the, this prosperity doctrine, and the many uh, splits that it had of these giant giant churches with you know hundreds of thousands of attendees who are financially and uh, and politically motivated to convince them to stay in this particular silo. So there's a there's a uh, a manipulative and unhealthy aspect that even that I, like I said it even pervades more mild churches because those churches are often a part of a broader uh, a doctrine or a, uh, a broader movement that does actively encourage we need to grow this movement and discourage people from going to any other way. So um, there is a um, there is no such thing as a mild or good church. And now we're going to get to the other side of this which is um, where I think a lot of people who've been super on board with what I've been saying so far um, might start to get a little bit mad at me. Um, and, uh, but I feel like the only way to have a healthy conversation about this topic is to actually engage with the whole issue. Um, so the idea that there's no such thing as a mild or good church is just not true. Um, I just i think that's insane i think that is is a ridiculous uh a ridiculous proposition um and uh the reason why i would say that is because uh is there's like i guess there's multiple angles i can approach this from first of all um there is uh, uh the religion Christianity is is here to stay for at least a very long time. You are not, no matter how hard uh, the fedora is tipped, uh, Christianity is not going to be eliminated. And to eliminate Christianity would mean emulating the absolute worst behaviors that you would denounce from Christianity. In order to eliminate a religion from the world in, that, in the way that, that some people speak, um, you would be engaging in a genocidal project, a genocidal project that is worse than the impact uh, of of the the the, the, the the churches that you claim cannot possibly be mild. It is um, absurd. Um, you can't do it that way. That's not the way that the world works. You can't just delete a religion from the world. You can aggressively argue against a religion, but the fact of the matter is some people are still going to believe and you just have to deal with that. You have to cope with that. And if your conclusion is, well, then I'm going to kill them en masse, um, I feel like you're coping with it the wrong way and that perhaps you are closer to your enemies than you might think. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah. Um, Mild churches are a part of a pipeline to create more extremists. No, that's not always true. Uh, in fact, I think that's not, I don't believe that's accurate at all. In fact, many mild churches um, serve as a preventative me measure from these extremist groups. If people can find, uh, let me talk about this. So on this point specifically, one of the things that the, the extremist cult that I grew up in used um, specifically to their advantage was social social isolation. They targeted one of their biggest demographics of converts was from their prison ministry and from their drug addiction ministry. Um, th th like by a huge margin, they were bringing in tons of people from their prison ministry and their drug addiction ministry. Why? Because people who are addicted to drugs are struggling and often suffer from being rejected uh, socially, or perhaps they already were, which led them to uh, become addicted in the first place. And people in prison are also, um, in the same way, separated. They have been separated from society. They don't have support networks. And so as a result, here comes this church and they say, you can be a part of something bigger. Welcome to our family. Just sign right here on the dotted line and you can become a God warrior and you will have togetherness with all of us. And the truth is that mild churches, churches that don't engage in aggressive evangelism can actually prevent that from ever happening in the first place. 
by being a location where people can find community and support networks that isn't a direct pipeline to hate. And, and I'm sorry, but that's just a matter of reality. They, uh, there are all kinds of churches around America that um, have all that, that are doing just fine and they don't, they explicitly resist um, going into a uh, hyper extreme religion uh, like some of these ones because they don't believe it. They don't believe that uh, hating gays is like, is key to Christianity. And so they build an environment that doesn't encourage that or that actively forbids that type of behavior. And yet they are able to provide some of the benefits of a church. Now that doesn't mean that these mild churches are perfect. I don't think so at all. And in fact, I do have critiques of, uh, of the dangers even that are present in mild churches that we're discussing. But the truth is that if there were more of these mild churches, less people would be tempted and pulled in or, or would be tempted isn't the right word. Less people would be manipulated into joining the extremist churches, which prey on their social isolation, which build them into a box of isolation. Um, these, uh, uh, the, the, one of the most the most prevalent things that you see in in these uh, uh, in these churches that are politically extreme that are uh, that are highly evangelical is that they deliberately try they do everything that they can to make sure that your only social network is the church itself that you, all of your friends are in the church. Maybe your boss is in the church. Maybe you just got out of prison and you can't find a job because our society is incredibly hostile to people with a, with a, you know, with a re criminal record. And so one of the guys in the church says, oh yeah, you know what? You're turning, you're, you're turning to God. Come on and work on my farm. Come on and work at my shop. Come on and work in my uh, welding, you know, welding shop. Come on and work at my mechanic shop. I, I'm, I'm doing a good thing for God here. And you know, you're getting your life back on track. And then all of a sudden your boss is in the church. All of your friends are in the church. You got, you got, you, your addiction program was in the church. You have nowhere to go. So these, these mild churches, Churches are actually able to provide healthier uh, social connections that prevent people from getting pulled into these highly manipulative cults. So I just don't agree with the idea that there's no such thing as a mild church. I don't agree with that. Um, yeah. Alt-right movements pull from the same stock of lonely people. Yeah, their tactics are the same. There, of course, and often you'll notice a lot of alt-right movements are infiltrated with members of these extreme church. The church that I grew up in works with TPUSA. You, we all know TPUSA as one of the big pipelines into the far right. The church that I grew up in works with fucking PragerU. The, these guys are hand in hand, okay? Syria says, I don't think it's right to say that these extreme churches are all indoctrinated people as opposed to the mild churches. Obviously, the mild churches aren't as predatory, but there are certainly indoctrinated people in the mild ones. I just got done saying that. I, I just got done saying that, like in the previous section, um, that even mild churches are a subject, are subject to the criticism on indoctrination. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I did a whole bit on that. But uh, that's okay. You don't worry, Sirius. I'm sure you'll hear it. But um, I just wanted to put that out there. So, another thing, okay? Which is, um, uh, people have a lot of reasons for why they're religious. Um, but people have a lot of reasons for why they're Christians. Um, as I've sort of repeatedly hammered on in this particular thing, one of the biggest reasons that people maintain adherence to a religion is because the people that they know and love are there as well. That they perceive themselves not just as a, as a believer in a God or in a particular doctrine, but that they see themselves as a part of a, of a community. Um, and that community is not so, it can't just be fedora tipped away. 
It has to be acknowledged, even by crit critics of religion, such as myself. I am, after all, an atheist. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the supernatural. Uh, certainly not in the way that Christians do. Um, and, uh, uh, and this type of approach has to be, like I said, it has to be acknowledged and handled with care. And also, there are times in which uh, it can be used for good. And if you don't believe me, we're going to come back to the original topic, which is this whole topic started as a result of discussing black American uh, Christian re religiosity. Um, and uh, uh, the civil rights movement in America was heavily, heavily organized through black churches, through all throughout the South, where the Christianity is not you, the Christianity is not going anywhere, but these churches were able to say, many of you are believers. Here is how we are. We choose to interpret the scripture. Here is how we choose to use our presence. Here is the type of community that we choose to build and what we are going to direct our followers to. And what, the, what I mean to say with that is that um, it is very possible for churches uh, to have, uh, uh, even if they are, even if there are uh, problematic aspects in the depths of Christianity, even if there are problematic problematic aspects all throughout Christianity, nonetheless, there are people have complicated reasons for why they ultimately re uh, are a part of this community, and those communities can still choose to be better. You see what I mean? That uh, uh, you you can't always have a a 100% uh, uh, a pure movement, especially with something that is as broad and as um, essential to life as Christian churches were in the South uh, and still are for a lot of people. For some people in the South, for some areas, not even in the South, for some people all over America, a church might be the only community center left the only place where there is any sense of community at all whatsoever. So those churches, um, the leaders of those churches, it is important that those churches are in encouraged and actively um, convinced to take better positions um, to the best of our ability. And sometimes that means going, I may not be able to convince you that God isn't real, but can I perhaps convince you that God doesn't hate the gays or the transes? Can I perhaps convince you that God would revile white supremacy? Can I perhaps convince you that God would revile anti-Semitism? Because the reality is that a lot of people simply won't be convinced on God. It is a very, very difficult thing to change someone's views on God. However, it is much easier to get them to reinterpret aspects of their belief um, uh, by meeting them where they're at. And that's not saying that you have to look the other way at problematic aspects of Christianity. It's just simply saying that the fact of the matter is there are a lot of Christians. There are an incredible, incredible amount of Christians in America, and the world would be a better place if people could convince those Christians to believe better things. If people could recognize that in some areas of the world, these uh, Christian churches might be the only lifeline that anyone has. And some of those people might be gay and queer. Some of those people uh, might belong to all kinds of other minority groups. Um, and that uh, a, a sort of a stubborn fedora tipping refusal to uh, acknowledge that um, actually does damage to the world as a whole and gets us further away from, the, uh, from solving the most problematic aspects of extremist religion belief. Um, and that's not saying that there aren't some, you know, that there aren't rural churches that are totally, um, you know, that are totally uh, unsalvageable. Um, I just don't think it's as simple as sort of saying, uh, as sort of just throwing your hands up and saying, fuck all of this. Um, 
and I don't always, and, and this isn't even just a thing that like you should try to change it from the inside. I just think that that devoted atheists even can have more productive conversations and can have a better discourse that actively encourages religious people to rethink the problematic aspects of their belief. And it would get you closer to your ultimate goal. If you're an atheist and you want people to challenge their religious beliefs on the core, um, you actually win by saying, well, did you ever think about this aspect? Because if you can get them to think about something that is, uh, that, that is, it is not core to their belief, it may open their mind to questioning other things. If they've been taught that you can't question anything, if they have been indoctrinated, getting through that can be very hard. And sometimes it's something as small as, do you really think that your God wants you to hate your gay sib sibling that you love? Do you really think your God wants that? And they go, well, I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm not supposed to do this. Maybe my pastor wants me to hate my sibling who's gay, but God doesn't. And that's a pretty big deal. I say that from experience as somebody who left and escaped an extremist religion. So, At an individual level that might work, but it's like trying to convince a Republican that they're wrong. That's a decision that's made on their end and not yours. Yes. Um, yes, but uh, Republicanism is a little bit different than uh, religion. Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, just gonna tell you, religious beliefs are, uh, are significantly deeper held than party affiliation, okay? There's nobody, uh, there's nobody, there's nobody out there who is more passionate, well, okay, there are people, there are people, but most, the vast majority of them are actual Republican Party officials who are more passionate about the Republican Party than they are about something else. But the, the religious right is full of people who are Republicans because they think Republicans are on God's side of things and because their churches are also convincing them of that, uh, it's more complicated. Religious belief is held way more deeply uh, than Republicanism, okay? Now you could make the argument that conservatism broader is fairly, can be fairly deeply held and I think there's truth there, but that goes beyond the scope of this discussion. I think that the God belief is a very deeply held thing for a lot of people, okay? A lot of even people who you wouldn't even consider that serious still hold God belief very deeply. And the reason for this is because the belief in God, the belief in the supernatural ties into your beliefs on death, ties into your beliefs on the human soul, ties into your belief on purpose and your place in the universe. These are incredibly complicated topics. And for a lot of people, the God answer fills uh, uh, fills space in their heart so that they don't feel anxious. And I think it's important to recognize that, even if you don't think that it's like a good way, because I don't either. I don't think that um, you know the easy answer of saying, oh, well, there's a God who's decided everything for me and it's all gonna be okay. And he's gonna let me live in a, um, you know, in a house made out of Xbox games, you know, when I die. I don't think that that's the best way to do things. I just think that um, recognizing why people come to those beliefs in the first place is fairly important when we're having these discussions. Yeah. God isn't an easy answer, not for most. Well, that's, I mean, I think for some people it is. I think for some people, uh, God uh, is is the way that they don't have to really think too much about death or about their place in the universe. But I, But what I mean is that I don't think it's like, I don't think their decision is easy. I don't think that people can just turn off the God belief switch. Um, and, uh, so I, 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 what I'm trying to say here is that indoctrination is a huge problem in Christianity generally, especially, no, not even especially it's, it's a problem in Christianity, Catholicism, 
evangelical uh, Christianity, prosperity doctrine, evangelicalism, all of these types, and now the rising Christian nationalism movement. All of these have huge issues with very explicit, hyper-siloed, hyper-xenophobic, um, anti-intellectual indoctrination that I do think is problematic. Um, but it is not as simple as just saying, uh, well, a lot of this is spread through familial indoctrination, which means uh, I don't have to think about it. You're just a stupid uh, uh, fundy. Because there are actually, like I said, there are a lot of Christians who do not hold the fundamentalist beliefs, who do not engage in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, uh, extremist right-wing uh, thought. And those people can actually serve as a bulwark. They can be... Um, they are they can be a they can they can they can make the world a better place if they want to and again once again an example of this how much civil rights organizing was done through christian churches because that was what was present that was what was uh what was available and it wasn't going to change um you know you can't just snap your fingers and have communities stop congregating in the only place that they've known for their entire lives as a safe community space um you have to say okay this is where people are and we should we should do our best to to take this place and make sure that it doesn't become a place where heinous hate can spread Unfortunately, sometimes it does. I absolutely uh, believe that it is worth, um, I mean, you guys know, I advocate some fairly um, strong and, and by American standards, extreme political beliefs. Um, and I hold by those strongly um, because I think that they're the correct things. And I think that that's a good thing to do. Um, what I don't think is a good thing to do uh, is to uh, 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 over is to uh, uh, completely overestimate uh, your your ability to actually reach the people that you supposedly want to reach and end up being a uh, end up being smug or or worse um, it, like totally wrong about their history um, and it actually backfires on you and makes the situation worse. Um, now, to be fair, I think a lot of this is stuff that's going to have to be done by Christians. I don't belong to Christian communities. I am not going to belong to Christian communities. Um, there are Christians in my audience right now who are Christians who are left-leaning, Christians who are progressive, and it's your job to help make sure that your Christian environments go in a better direction, not on my behalf, but for yourself for the betterment of your own belief system. Um, and uh, that's something I can't do. But what I can do is I can say, I appreciate the people who are doing that. The people who have a uh, you know, deeply held God belief, which I may or may, have, may, or may not have uh, you know, questions or disagreements with, but who nonetheless take that belief and make the world a better place to the best of their ability. Um, yeah. I uh, uh, I have a lot of issues with um, religion as it functions in our world right now. Um, and a lot of it, I think, is a byproduct of the scars that have, you know, that have sort of uh, uh, torn our world apart. Uh, again, we all sit here, lefties all sit here all the time and talk about how devastated social spaces have have become the disappearance of place of, of places where people don't have to pay money uh to just be able to socialize with one another uh people have more uh, uh more more um isolated and alienated workplaces than ever before in history there are people whose entire workplace is in their car and they never speak to another person uh uh, at their workplace, you know, working for Uber or as an Amazon delivery driver or, you know, as a task rabbit or whatever, all these other jobs that these these gig economy jobs where you're completely isolated. Um, people have less and less places to engage socially. And the reality is churches are one of the few that remain. 
um, that has to be grappled with in reality. People have to acknowledge, oh my God, these churches are act are, 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 can very well become horrific, horrific, nightmarish uh, uh, places of right wing indoctrination. Um, and yeah, I, 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 but uh, but not all of them are. Uh, they're not all like that. So, yeah, we shouldn't be making work friends. Work is work. What? What? What are you talking about? Humans are social creatures. We should be making friends everywhere. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by chat. I, I look at chat for the first time in the last like 10 minutes and the first thing I see makes me go, what? We need to get back to bars, pubs, clubs and stuff. I mean, yeah, sure, all kinds of things. But you should still make friends at work. Work is, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. Anyway. Um, so there's one last thing to talk about on this topic, and then I'll sort of open into a general, um, a general, um, you know, conversation, and I'll take some questions from chat and whatever. Um, which is... I already kind of touched on this a little bit, but in this particular tweet, going back to the tweet that, that started all of this, this sentiment here, black Americans are religious because they were indoctrinated into it by their slave owners historically. Sounds not good. Um, indoctrination by slave owners absolutely did happen. But now a lot of black Americans are religious or are Christians for a lot of reasons. Um, and you might be able to trace those things back to all kinds of things. Um, but black Americans, black American Christians, much like all Christians, have many reasons why they are Christians. Um, and it's not just indoctrination. It's not as simple as that. Um, like I even said, even with the uh, extremist corners, the churches like the ones that I grew up in that were extreme. Um, indoctrination only works uh, 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 partially because of the, the, the social needs that are at play there. Um, so I think that there's a, a diagnostic issue that is wrong with this tweet, in addition to the fact that the way that it is worded, it comes off as incredibly uh, condescending and dehumanizing um to black americans who believe in christianity and it especially comes off as somewhat um you know a gauche no not even gauche just offensive when you consider how involved in uh certain liberation struggles black churches were more so by a long shot than white churches let's just be real about that white Christians have if anybody if you're gonna yell at anybody if you're gonna say anybody has the problem the white Christians have the bad track record of being uh, way worse political actors than black churches black churches while I'm not saying all of them are super progressive or anything there are definitely super conservative black churches black churches in America have a way better track record on being on the right side of uh, of liberatory issues especially social issues like civil rights voting rights etc um yeah exactly black christianity has developed massively since the days of slavery yes and in fact it was reclaimed in a lot of ways um and that's why i think that this this statement just is not useful it, it's the type of and 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 why i disagree with it even though like I said, I spent the entire first half of this discussion talking about the problem of indoctrination, um, which I do think is a huge problem. This tweet uh, uh, is just completely misinterprets the history of black Christianity. Black Christianity, which was largely a, uh, a, a taking for oneself, saying uh, this religion was taught to us and perhaps I believe it, but this is my religion now, and I am going to teach a liberatory version of this religion. I mean, uh, uh, liberation theology is a huge, uh, uh, is a is a huge, huge, huge aspect of a lot of Black American 
Christian churches. So yeah, um, I, I feel like, I mean, again, I'm not trying to rag too hard on anybody who engaged in this conversation. I hope that you guys can recognize my attempts to grow this conversation beyond the limitations of Twitter. But there are aspects of this conversation that I feel must be addressed. Uh, and that was one of them. The idea that like the only reason anybody's a Christian is because of indoctrination is just not correct. And also, um, I don't even, I don't even like, I don't know. Uh, I, it, that message won't even reach the Christians that you would hope to, to leave the religion. Realizing the aspects of myself, being somebody who grew, again, I've said this a hundred times, but coming from a, a background of, of uh, intense indoctrination, being in a church, in an extreme church from a young age, being told what to think, um, I had a genuine belief. I had a tr very, very deep and powerful belief in God. And it was that belief in God that actually ultimately led me to question the church that did the indoctrination and later gave me the freedom to then say, hold on a second. Um, some of this was pure indoctrination. Uh, it was uh, not that like, that that there wasn't a, a, a truth to my beliefs, um, but rather that my that my belief had been twisted, had been uh, had been um, uh, shaped in a particular direction. And uh, again, I've said this on my stream a hundred times before, and I'll say it again, and I'll say it again an infinite amount of times in the future. I stopped being a member of the cult before I stopped being a Christian. There's a reason for that. It was because my genuine interest, my genuine beliefs uh, came up into conflict with the religion. And I realized that the, the cult, the church itself, uh, was less important than the actual things that I truly believed in my heart. And I, I think that a lot of, uh, of, of atheists in my audience, a lot of anti-Christian people in my audience would benefit to know that sort of thing. Um, because I would love to see more people uh, be liberated from extreme religion. And I'm not even saying become an atheist, just to be liberated from the type of indoctrination that does it, that, that is present in a lot of these places. I would love to see people find their religion, find a way that, that to make their belief a tool of liberation instead of a tool of bondage. Because that's what a lot of this indoctrination is. This indoctrination is taking genuinely held and genuinely felt religious belief and twisting it into shackles to make someone a pawn as a part of a greater agenda. Or, a, or you know, in a matrix-like way, a battery to be absorbed for labor and money and, uh, and, you know, attendance numbers and all kinds of other things. Um, as time has gone on, I mean, I've talked, uh, I did a whole video on the, you know, Reddit atheism and smug atheism, but as time has gone on, I've realized that the, uh, the conversation around religion has to evolve. Um, and it has to evolve by people who are most critical of religion actually doing a better job at critiquing religion. Um, that's just the way that it is. Uh, it, people just sort of like, and I'm not gonna say that you that like n you know poking fun at Christian. I mean, I fucking make fun of religious, super religious Christians, especially the hateful ones, all the time. I'm not trying to rain on anybody's parade, and jokes here and there are fine, but. It's good to, de to determine, you know, when you're joking versus when you're actually engaging with people and trying to change minds and trying to, to you know, uh, set forth an argument. And uh, and I think it's I think I think it's a good time for a lot of online atheists to sort of rethink their tactics a little bit, um, especially because. Uh, again, uh, one of the most rising popular forms of Christianity in America right now is fascism, um, aka Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is uh, is 
dangerous, actively and unbelievably dangerous. And Christians who are progressive, Christians who follow, who, who, who purport to follow Jesus's teachings, you guys should be concerned too, because Christian nationalism is the perfect example of subjugating genuine belief into a political agenda uh, of supremacy uh, that will put everyone in chains. It will never be that the Christian nationalist movement does not seek to uh, follow God's teachings. It seeks to utilize the, the fervent beliefs of real believers to uh, put specific people in power, people like Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump. And uh, these people generally are some of the most heinously immoral people by the Christian standards. Uh, uh, you know, Ron DeSantis is not a Christian man. Ron DeSantis was a torturer, uh, allegedly, at Guantanamo Bay. Um, you know, Donald Trump, well, I don't need to say anything about Donald Trump, you know? So, I mean, hell, I did this whole video talking about Christianity with devil horns on my head. I, I know who I'm talking to mostly. Um, but, uh, um, and anyway. see what people have to say. Uh, there may have been stuff that I missed, so let's see what everybody has to say. Spiral Gal says, do you think that outreach to sympathetic religious groups is, in, is needed to bridge the gap between atheists and cool religious people? Um, yeah, uh, I actually do think that there can be some great value that comes from that. Um, I mean, hell, uh, uh, even things like university interfaith uh, organizations, um, are able to be used in a very positive way by simply exposing people who might otherwise be indoctrinated to people of different belief systems. Um, I think that there's a lot to be gained uh, from religious people talking to people of other religions, from religious people talking to atheists, and hell, even from atheists talking to all types of different religious people. Um, you know, not in like a arena of ideas type way, but in a genuine attempt to learn and improve the world. I think these things can be very valuable. Um, and I do think that, um, that we should basically uh, we should basically be willing to uh, try and understand, at least to some degree, uh, uh, that like a lot of what we would, what people might consider mild Christians or progressive Christians or Christian leftists are very, very, very much uh, in agreement with even us atheists when it comes to, oh my God, we gotta, we gotta stop this Christian nationalism shit from taking off because that's its own entire thing that is very dangerous and i think that a lot of uh, a lot of left leaning christians would be more than willing to uh to work even with other people who don't share their exact religious beliefs in preventing the psychotic uh nonsense that is christian nationalism Brandy the Taoist Warlock with the incredibly generous $10 super chat. Thank you for supporting the show. If it please you, there's an Onion article that's pretty fun for illustrating the hypocrisy in Christian nationalism. The title is Christians Explain Why Jesus Was Too Liberal. Um, I It is shocking how much uh, that is present in, in churches like the one I grew up in. Um, basically, they constantly have to uh, uh, avoid certain things that Jesus talked about because it was uh, pussy shit, you know? It's fucking pathetic. Hemorrhoid King with the unbelievably generous $5. We all know Jesus would have been on estrogen, right? And as per usual, incredible segment. Thank you so very much for supporting the show. I, I have my suspicions. I have my suspicions about Jesus. Somniostatic says, Lucy and I were looking into the history of Christianity and Judaism in Africa. It's ridiculously complicated. Oh, yeah, it is. Christianity has been in Africa forever. Again, it predates the slave trade. Now, it is true that there was a lot of um, indoctrination of, of, of slaves by slave owners into American Christianity. Um, but that's not the be all end all. No history is never that simple, and this history is certainly not that simple either. 
two guys history says i feel like the issues you are talking about are all true demon mama but i think credit where credit is due religion christian religion inspired the enslaved to resist and the sincere belief that Ch chattel slavery was a sin uh, animated abolitionists the topic of religion in america is very nuanced you're correct um a lot of abolitionists were christians and tried to tackle cr slavery from a christian lens now that doesn't mean that christianity doesn't deserve um, critique on a deeper level, on a philosophical level, but I think it does, it should bring our attention to the idea that uh, Christian belief in America is not a single flavor. There isn't a single uh, um, unifying type of Christianity and that that should be kept in mind um, and that that should be recognized and not uh, just erased. A Pillow says, Demon Mama, you hit it entirely on the head with black Christianity. It's been an extremely important part in the fight for our rights as a group. I will say, though, I think it'd be beneficial to move past it in the modern day as it's really holding us back in terms of internal queer acceptance. That's interesting, too, um, because it... I mean, I think that's a big struggle of the modern of the modern uh, moment, right? Especially among Christians, is how they're going to... Um, interpret uh, uh how they're going to interpret uh the the bible's you know sometimes fairly explicit statements on gay and uh gender non-conforming people um and i don't know uh i mean if i'm completely honest the bible is not exactly very good on slavery either um in fact, it's somewhat hypocritical on the issue of slavery. Uh, slavery is explicitly endorsed in some portions of the Bible, despite the fact that some of the stories of the Bible are explicitly about people breaking free from slavery. Um, so it's one of those things where uh, and these issues have to be settled in, you know, and people, it's not even just so much as moving on beyond Christianity. Within the Christian movements, they have to decide where they stand on the issues and push for those things. Uh, like I said, as you, as we've mentioned here, as you mentioned, um, slavery and civil rights were, they, you know, black churches said, uh, we know where we stand and this is what we believe God would want in this time period. And I think the same can be done for queer issues as well. Though, um, I'm not entirely in disagreement. I do think that, um, I'm an atheist at the end of the day. I do think that a lot of times moving beyond the framework of, of, of religious belief of, uh, you know, dogma can help you come to better moral and ethical positions. So, yeah. L, L, L. Asmodeus says, do you think it would be effective to encourage Christians to interpret the world in the spirit of Christ rather than through the strict doctrine of the Bible? Yes, yes, absolutely. If we can't shake a person's belief in Christ, perhaps we could shake their belief in the absolute infallibility and coherence of Christian texts. Yes, I actually believe that is an incredibly effective tactic. Uh, especially because it is very, very easy to show a Christian that the Bible that they pull from is one translation, a translation which had books removed from it, which had words changed, a heavily editorialized version. One of the biggest things for me uh, growing up as a Christian, when I was a Christian, uh, was getting a, a study Bible. I got a Bible that had four different versions of the Bible in it. So I actually have it uh, downstairs on my bookshelf. Um, and when you, I've showed it off on stream before. When you open it up, there is the New International Version, the King James Version, the Oxford Study Bible, and uh, I don't remember the fourth translation. But they're all side by side with footnotes. And um, that Bible allowed me to realize that it almost immediately uh, uh, allowed me to realize that there are many interpretations of the Bible that even translators can't always agree on exactly everything, which encourages people to think for themselves. So yes, El Asmodeus, I, I think that um, I think that that's an incredibly, incredibly uh, valuable angle, very much so. Emu Anon 34 says, I like to think that the belief in the afterlife is a survival instinct, like we've accepted death, but at the same time we haven't. Yeah, I think it is. I think it very much is. 
A Pillow says, it's low key kind of funny. My first video was on how black Christianity has been hindering the community in terms of internal acceptance of queer people. It was beneficial in the past for sure, but I do think personally that it might be best to develop new community spaces for activism because of that. I believe in that regardless. I think that um, for Christians and non-Christians alike, we have to, as, a entire, as an entire world, we need to come up with new ways to develop a, uh, healthier and better community spaces because something that i haven't even talked about in this whole thing is the general limitations of hierarchical community space churches are hierarchical not all churches in the entire world but most christian churches are explicitly hierarchical you are in a place of god which is overseen by a father or a minister or a pastor um and that isn't the best type of social space in my opinion so i think regardless of even like broader than this conversation i think building new community spaces building new ways of socializing is so important oh my god it's so 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 important and i don't have all the answers but you guys know i talk about this all the time and one of the things i encourage my community to do all the time is to build real social connections with one another um we can't help the fact that uh you know a pandemic happened uh that 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 jobs uh and the economy constantly tries to separate us uh, we can't help that, that that's a fact. What we can do is we can try to use our brains to come up with new ways to connect with one another in very real ways. And I think that is going to be so powerful. You want to know who did this? The Black Panthers. The Black Panthers was an organization that did an incredible good job with this. Everything from setting up breakfast cafeterias to health clinics to, uh, you know, uh, community libraries. All of these were innovations in, in social connection um, that ended up being so powerful. I have received health care at a Black Panther founded clinic that now it serves an, an enormous amount of people as a public health clinic, which is amazing. That is such an amazing thing that, that an, an act like that can end up having rippling effects that can save people's lives decades into the future. K might, K might be giant says, I don't understand how people who are also atheists can't be empathetic towards people who are still religious or spiritual for their own reasons. If said people aren't trying to infringe or indoctrinate or judge others, I think it's overstepping to try to police those beliefs as they are for obvious reasons. Um, I, that's a big, that's a big topic. I did a whole video about anti-theism and, and, you know, I have my thoughts on that. Um, but yeah, I do think people should be more understanding um, especially because you don't actually know what someone's political beliefs are just because of their religious beliefs. Um, you know, like I said, you might meet a Christian who's the most accepting person that you've ever found, who truly believes their reason for being a Christian uh, is because of, you know, brotherly love and whatever, and they might be the most accepting person ever. I think people, sh I think, I think the fedora tipper type atheist, the lay Reddit atheist type need to take a chill pill. Um, I'm not saying that they, they can't have any of their jokes or whatever, or that they're not right in being mad at aspects of Christianity. God knows there's a lot of aspects of Christianity I'm mad at, but they should probably, uh, you know, think about things a little more and recognize that they're dealing with a complicated issue, uh, especially if they're an ex-Christian. Wouldn't it be terrible if for the rest of your life, because you were once, uh, you know, indoctrinated into a religion, that you had to be, I don't know, uh, care like that that had to be a millstone around your neck forever because at one point you know when you were a kid I don't know I, I think that's ridiculous I think it's a very weird approach and I think it's a uh, hypocritical and cognitively dissonant Mithril with the incredibly generous $10 super chat my late dad was a C of E a Church of England vicar and a communist he went out of his way to help the helpless to offer hope and wasn't scared to confront hierarchies based that is amazing. That is super, super cool. That is very, very based. Vine says, admittedly, I'm extremely atheist at this point, but I do have to admit John Brown was a very big Christian and his beliefs are what animated him into action to fight back against slavery, believing slavery to be a sin against God. 
Com beliefs are complicated. A pillow says, yeah, you hit this topic really great. Thank you, A-Pillow. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Arcanon says, I feel like we should be more aggressive towards religious institutions because that is the only way we can make progress. Every step of the way, the church will stand in the way. Even the civil rights movement was hindered by other churches. You can't cherry pick the role of churches in these situations. Christianity will always hinder our liberation. Um, Christianity isn't the church. Christianity is so much bigger than a single church. Uh, churches want you to, uh, us to, uh, to churches want you to believe that they are the true version of Christianity. But the reality is that uh, Christianity is uh, very is incredibly varied. Even, even if, even to the protests of the Catholic Church, even to the protests of, of mega churches, Christianity is, whether they like it or not, ridiculously varied. And that it takes power away from them to acknowledge that Christianity is, bar is varied. It weakens their claim to divine right when you acknowledge that there are believers of all different types, that there are, there are an infinite number of believers. It weakens the hold that these, uh, m m like, organized, institutionalized uh you know religious groups have over faith and that's a good thing i don't think you have uh, i think that recognizing that christianity is more complex than a single church uh and that there are churches who think about issues different is key i think it's very valuable um in a lot of ways so yeah uh there are certain churches that i think will always stand in the way of progress i think the catholic church being that it is a hyper hierarchical, hyper centralized, hyper uh, entrenched uh, institution will always stand in the way of progress. Uh, I don't think an institution of that time, I mean, it's a state in and of itself. The, the Catholic Church, uh, the centralized Catholic Church is a, it's a would-be state. It is a, it is an attempted, it is, it is, it, it functions as a state. It literally has a capital city. And I oppose that, of course. Emu Anon says, show me the study Bible. I love looking at manuscripts. I don't have it in here. The study Bible is downstairs, but I'll show it sometime on stream. I've showed it before. This short video explains how the King James Version deliberately translated things in a way that would benefit the monarchy. All right, let's hit it. That sounds awesome. That sounds very fitting here. Let's do it. The Bible never calls these two stone tablets the Ten Commandments. Wait. What? Yeah, in Hebrew, this list of items delivered by God to Moses is called the Azaret HaDevarim, which means the Ten Words. This is something oh. that the Greek translators preserved when they called it the Decalogue, the Ten Words. Same with the Latin Vulgate, we have the Decem Verba. And even in the 1500s, William Tyndale is still calling this list the Ten Verses, which is much more oh. neutral. Then, all of a sudden, with the King James Version, we have this This is kind curious... of a soft video. Sorry about the low audio levels. I... I always forget is it video oh, it's watch there we go okay now i can turn it up all right let's hit this the again the bible the... never calls these two stone Sorry about tablets that. the 10 commandments wait what? Yeah, in Hebrew, this list of items oh, thank you, delivered so by asked. God to Moses is called the Azaret HaDevarim, which means the Ten Words. This is something that the Greek translators preserved when they called it the Decalogue, the Ten Words. Same with the Latin Vulgate, we have the Decem Verba. And even in the 1500s, William Tyndale is still calling this list the Ten Verses, which is much more neutral. Then, all of a sudden, with the King James Version, we have this curious switch to the Ten Commandments. Now, why would a king who's sponsoring a version of the Bible in order to cement his political power be interested in rebranding this list as mm. the Ten Commandments? Hmm. You'll have to stay tuned for part two, but I do- This is so cool. This is such an interesting video. I've been reading a book um, that is called, it's called Before Religion, um, uh, a, a History of a Modern Concept by Brent Nongbri. And uh, uh, the book Before Religion um, it explains a ton of examples of this happening where um, the concept of religion, um, uh, it, basically he makes a case that the way that the word religion um, and the various words that are now currently um, mostly in the like post 
colonial English period um, uh, translated as like religion often refer to ways of life, ways of doing thing, things as opposed to a distinct uh, like dogma that you subscribe to or are, are a part of. It's super interesting and I, I there's no way I can summarize the whole book in a stream, um, but it's a super fascinating book and it talks about all kinds of examples um, uh, uh, of, of this type of thing. Yeah, it was recommended to me by President Sunday and it's been a genuinely fantastic uh, read so far. Oh, cool, this is interesting. All right, let's hear this one. This guy's got cool videos. Here we go. Let's watch this. Let's watch this one real quick. He's got another short. You've probably heard that Eve was formed from one of Adam's ribs, but the reason behind that translation choice might be misogyny. Wait, what? Yeah, in the Bible, there's actually a proper anatomic word for a rib bone. It's the Aramaic Allah, and we see it in places like Daniel, where a bear has three rib bones in his mouth. But in Genesis, when Eve is being formed, it says that God took a cella from Adam. And this word is never translated as rib anywhere else in the Thank Bible. Thank you, a pillow. In all 40 other instances, it's either translated as half or side. Like in Exodus 37, the Ark of the Covenant has two wow. separate sides. Or the Do you see? This type of stuff is the type of stuff that would have like hit really, really, really hard for me when I was a Christian. And it did. I never even knew this one, but this type of stuff was fascinating to me when I was a Christian, and I would have eaten this type of stuff up. The two sides on the split door that leads into Solomon's temple. But, you know, if you're interested in promoting a worldview in which women are subordinate to men, it doesn't really help you to have an origin story where Eve comes from an equal part of Adam, you kind of like the vibe of Eve coming from this tiny, insignificant rib. And so... Oh no, why'd it cut off? Aww. Does he have a second one? Where's the... Where's the, the second part? Oh, why did it... Where's the part two? It loops, but also it just cut in the middle of a sentence. Oh well, whatever. We got the idea. We got the core idea. Oh. Oh, I see. So when you hold on, folks. Whoa, that's a sense. You've probably heard that Eve was formed. Rib. And so. And so. You've probably heard that Eve. Oh, and so you've probably heard. Oh, OK. All right. That's kind of creative. Yeah, it played to a uh, it went to a Sam Cedar short after that. Le Legate Lanius Jr. says, do you think leftists avoid criticizing Islam to this degree in fear of being branded a racist? Now Christians and Muslims are uniting. How did anyone not see that coming? No, um, I don't think, uh, I don't think that that's, um, no, I don't believe that. I think that's a, I think that's a misdiagnosis and I'll explain why real quick. Um, I think the reason why a lot of leftists don't spend a whole lot of time um, criticizing Islam is because, first of all, Islam is not a, a meaningful uh, political faction in America. And I, I this is for American leftists, obviously, English-speaking leftists. Um, Islam, Islamic belief is a, is a remarkably small portion of people in this country. So uh, I don't think that leftists spend a lot of time criticizing Islam um, because it, you know, because you're basically just, um, you're, you're, you're fixating on a group that is not um, particular, like not a major like threat or anything like that. Like, uh, you know, uh, like extremist Muslim behavior is not uh, widespread in the United States. So um, why would people talk about it that much? And secondly, the other reason why leftists don't is not because they're afraid of being racist, but because they're just not racist. If you'll notice the people who fixate on extremist Islam, 
it's right-wingers because they're racist and they want to make Muslims seem like the giant threat so they can justify a forever war. Uh, the war hawks are all about doing this thing. They want to stoke fear in the other. So lefties are just like, um, why would I do that? So every like every time this comes up, I always just go, I don't know. I see lefties willing to talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, extremist aspects of Islam all the time. In fact, I mean, I just, just by all the time, I mean, relative to how much extremist Muslim is, extremism there is in the United States and, and Canada, etc. Et there just isn't that much of it here. Uh, lefties are still like all, all the lefties I watch at least are more than willing to denounce or talk about or critique aspects of, of Islam that are harmful. Um, yeah, so I just, I think that's a misdiagnosis. I don't think it's a matter of people being afraid. I think they just, uh, I think they just aren't racists, first of all, uh, or at least aren't as racist as the right. And, uh, and also that it's not as big of an issue here. Whereas Christianity is still by far, by, by far and away the dominant religion. Yeah. But I, I, I know some people interpret it as like, uh, I don't know, you're afraid to be racist, but I don't think it's that. I really don't. Um, yeah. There's actually, uh, Fels Forma says, Demon Mama, there's a discussion in post-Hellenization Jewish texts about how Adam was an andro androgynous, having both male and female organs, which changes your perception of God as well, since obviously Adam was built in the image of God. Yeah, it does, doesn't it, right? Um, people, it's really funny. I saw, like, there was some... Uh, I was I was making fun. I, I did a segment making fun of conservative Christians really recently um, and which some of you probably enjoyed where I was talking about this lady who was like freaking out about non-binary people and uh, she was just like, you know, um, God, uh, God made man and woman in his image. I'm like, well, hold on a second. Think about that for a second. If God made man and woman in his image, why are you saying his, first of all? And secondly, uh, does that not imply that God contains both male and female? That God does not exist on a binary? God is above that. Like, the non-binary exists in your worldview. You just can't acknowledge it. Yeah. Um, it was very, uh, again, and I was joking because I felt, I, I always joke about how, um, Christian conservatives are the dumbest of the Christians. Christian conservatives refuse to actually engage with their own religion and their own beliefs to a full extent. They're like, um, they're the most, they're, they, they, they can't actually enjoy the Bible to the fullest. They can't learn the most that they can because they have, their prejudices come first. So they ignore the, the full depths of the Bible in lieu of feeling safe and warm in their shitty worldview. Lauren X Pandamus says, what do you think about Putin's weaponization of Orthodox Christianity against queer people and painting queer people as Western imperialism? Oh, I mean, that's just, that's just fascist. I mean, arguably that's closer to Nazi behavior. Um, it's finding you, you exploit uh, a dominant belief system and you weaponize it against a minority that you frame as uh, invaders. You know, oh, the the queer uh, the queer ideology is a is a it's a uh, a sinister force that's degenerating the youth. It's a a tale as old as time. The Nazis did literally the exact same thing. Instead of calling it Western, they called it Jewish degeneracy, and they literally did the same thing. They appealed to the to the uh, the Christianity of Germany. Uh, uh, and and fixated on on stoking queer hatred and then said that you know queer people were the results of Jewish degeneracy same exact thing it's wild all right it looks like we've more or less reached the um I think we've more or less reached the extent of this topic. Thank you all for listening to me please make sure you uh, subscribe and leave a like on the video much love to all of you. Keep on listening for the signal.